I don't know if you spend much time thinking about heaven. <clears throat> I probably don't think I spend about as much time as maybe some do, or maybe I spend more, I'm not quite sure, but occasionally it kind of comes to mind, maybe I'm reading through scripture or someone kind of mentions something. I feel like in conversations with non-Christian, heaven gets brought up a whole lot more than with Christians, I don't know. Um, but I was thinking about heaven the other day, and I was thinking that the unemployment rate in heaven is going to be really, really high. You know, we talk a lot about like unemployment and rates and whether they're accurate. I was just thinking, yeah, unemployment rate in heaven is going to be really, really high. I mean, I'm out of a job, for starters, you know, that don't think they're going to need a pastor when they've got God on hand. Doctors, mm, sorry, kind of gone uh, from what I can tell. Um, I was thinking about some of these kind of other areas, and, and I was like, gee, well, if both myself and Meg's out of a job, you know, what are we going to spend our time doing in heaven? You know, start kind of going down this path, what's it going to be like? And then you kind of discover more and more that there's probably less to know about heaven than we probably think that we know. But I felt like even thinking about this idea of unemployment and the idea of heaven and, and what it meant for even Jesus to talk about the kingdom of heaven, which is, of course, available to us right now, it got me thinking about work. It got me thinking about our contribution. It got me thinking about timing. And, um, and that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. We're just going to be doing a really quick two-week series on this. And the reason we're doing a two-week series is because there are some things that we just need to constantly be reminded of. Like, they're just areas that we just need to have a refresher every few months just to get our head in the right place when it comes to something that is so significant in taking up a lot of our time. And when I talk about work tonight, I want to recognize that there's all kinds of work. There's work in terms of our professional roles. There's work that we do in the home, in raising kids, perhaps. There is all kind of work that we do in all these different areas, and yet there are some really significant kind of truths that sit below this concept of work that have been there from the very beginning of creation. And so this series is really, first and foremost, around challenging this idea of the sacred and the secular divide that exists within society. Because we tend to like to carve this up. Even Christians like to carve it up this way. It's like there's this aspect of my life or a society which is kind of sacred. This is the God stuff. This is where God is at work, usually between 9.30 and 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning, maybe between 5 and 6 if we're lucky. You know? And there's kind of like that kind of area as well as, as well as our ministries. But then there is other areas of our life that we kind of are tempted to consider a bit more secular. It's like, oh, you know, my workplace, God, that's pretty heavy, it's pretty demanding, that's kind of pretty, pretty rough there, that's kind of what we put in the secular category. Me hanging out with my mates, you know, who maybe don't share the same value, that's kind of secular space. And so while we may not kind of consciously do this, we, we tend to kind of internally do this. We say some stuff is God stuff and some stuff is just the brokenness of the world. I'm going to pick this one up, uh, Rich. Um, it's the brokenness of the world the stuff that we don't necessarily believe that God is a part of. And yet we need to regularly consider the fact that every part of life, there is opportunity for kingdom impact and kingdom invitation as people on mission every day. And so this week we're going to be talking about workers' worship and the next week we're going to be talking about the marketplace for mission. And so if you've never heard about this sacred secular divide, I think this is a pretty good definition. The pervasive belief that some things are really important to God and other things aren't. <laughs> this is kind of the sacred secular, sacred secular divide, that some things are really important to God and other things aren't. And, and so we kind of tend to make this kind of division. We tend to do this, but it certainly isn't the case. You know, a lot of people don't think of their work, wherever that may be, as inherently spiritual. Sometimes even Christians kind of consider work to be some sort of necessary evil. It's like the old, I'll put my nose to the grindstone, I'll do my work, and then I can generate income, and then I can use that income for God's purposes, yeah? And so that kind of becomes a little bit of the narrative. I only do the work because it generates some sort of income, so I can then honour God with my income. But at the same time, this isn't reflective of the biblical narrative at all. 
Sometimes, on the flip side, even when we talk about something like workers' worship, people think about worship and, of course, they think about amazing songs. They think about singing in church. Maybe they think about offering some sort of like little gift or lighting a candle, something that kind of connects us with the divine. And that isn't necessarily untrue, but worship cannot be contained to only these places. Remembering that worship comes from that word worth. It's about giving worth to something. Yet how many of us actually don't actually attribute enough worth in terms of the spiritual dynamic of our work environment? And so I would argue that very few people, whether they be Christian or whether they not be Christian, actually understand the connection between their faith and their work. And that's what I want us to be reminded of tonight, that there is a deep profound, godly connection between the work that we do and the faith that we carry. It isn't some sort of necessary evil. In fact, it is an incredible opportunity to worship our amazing God. And like I said, it has been there from the beginning. And that's where we're going to start in Genesis chapter 1. So first of all, we have this narrative, this poem that we exist here that many of you will be very familiar with. I want to dig into it a little bit. It says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, if you need to find it, just open the cup cover of your Bible. It'll be right there at the beginning. It says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. You already get this incredible imagery here right at the beginning. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. So we've got this incredible creation narrative which kind of talks about like this kind of, it paints this picture of, you know, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and it describes now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep. Now, I haven't quite got my Hebrew quite of correct, but the one thing I do know is that when it talks about this formless and empty, it's these words tohu vavohu, okay, tohu vavohu, which is just this really fascinating term, right? Because while we translate it as formless and empty, and that's how it's often translated, it also carries this idea of uh, bringing order out of the chaos, and that is that over the surface of the deep, there is this kind of wild and waste type situation. It's not just that it's formless and empty. That kind of gives us this idea of deficit. It's like something is missing. But actually this image or these words, tohu vavohu, paints something different. It paints this kind of chaos that exists. And this taps into a whole lot of the kind of uh, the, the first century narrative around water and darkness and, and the danger of water. I mean, think to uh, many of the illustrations all throughout the New Testament where people are, are travelling over the Sea of Galilee and then the storm brews up, Right? Like, this wasn't just about a storm. This actually tapped into some deep-felt beliefs around the idea of water and around the risk that was associated with water, that death could be associated with water, that there was this wild and waste potential that existed, hence why this idea of darkness over the surface of the deep. And so right at the beginning of creation, it's not just about an absence of something and then boom, there is something there. Actually, the narrative is around this idea of there is chaos, there is something that needs to be ordered. There is something that needs to move and shift in order to be a true and good creation. And this is really important because it reminds us that, number one, God is in the business of creativity. He wants to create. He wants to produce good things. But secondly, that God is in the business of bringing order. He wants to bring order out of the chaos. Right from the very beginning in this narrative creation, it isn't just about creating something. It's around bringing order out of chaos. And this is something that we step into. Notice what God calls the light. He calls it good. And there's this refrain over and over again throughout this narrative creation. God does something creative. He brings some order. And then he calls it good. He says, this is good, good and good. In fact, by the end of creation, he says, this is very good. So creation isn't just about producing something out of nothing. It is actually about bringing order out of chaos. But then we see something even perhaps more profound around the role that he gives us as humans. It says in Genesis 2, uh, verses 8 to 9, we're stepping into the second creation narrative here. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east 
in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. And in the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree with the very long name. It continues in verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And so the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. What I love about this is, again, in the creation narrative, we get this image of God bringing order out of the chaos. There is something that God is up to that he wants us to imitate. And then secondly, we actually see some instructions in terms of those first humans around what that order looks like, what that role looks like. And so the first thing that we see is that God commands the man to take care of the garden. He's like, I've given you all this beautiful stuff, all these trees and this tree, which has a really long name. Don't, don't go there. But apart from that, you've got all this beautiful stuff and your role is to look after it. It's to tend to it. It's to make sure that it is cared for. This is work. This is purpose. This is God actually partnering with humanity and inviting them to be part of the creative process, which is just quite profound when you think about it. I don't know if you've ever really thought about creation, but, but when you think about even the narrative of creation, God made the trees, he made the animals, and what did he say after making these things? He essentially said, go produce more. He instilled creation with potential, right? And that was potential for good or for bad, but nevertheless, it was potential, and then somebody had to look after it. It wasn't just like, there's not enough whales, chuck in some more whales, speak some more whales into existence. He's like, hey, I'm placing creation there, I'm instilling it with potential, so now make more. And sometimes we forget this. We forget that God is a God who loves to create. God is a God who loves to bring order out of the chaos. God is a God who creates creation and then instills it with potential. And he is a God who asks and invites his people to then look after this creation, to tend to it, to tend to the garden, and, and as we see here in these later verses, to name the animals. This was meaningful work that God gave humanity to do. And may I remind you that this all occurs before Genesis chapter 3, when the fall happens, yeah? This is all meaningful work, a part of God's good creation that he wants us to be a part of. So this isn't post-fall. This isn't like work only happens when things get hard. This is before the fall. Before the brokenness entered the story, God had invited every single one of us to do meaningful work and imitate him in his creativity, in his love and care and stewardship. Work is not the consequence of sin. Now, how hard and demanding work in is, should I say, is part of the consequence of sin. We get to that in Genesis 3. But work itself is not a consequence of sin. It's something that God created us to experience, which can blow our mind a little bit sometimes. You know, we're there in maybe our backyard and we've got a little veggie patch and we're planting our tomatoes and suddenly we remember that we're actually stepping into the very command that God gave the first humans to look after and care for and participate in the ongoing creation of the earth. Essentially, Similar to Genesis chapter 1, he invites Adam to bring order out of the chaos. I want you to tend to this garden. I don't want things to be wild and waste. I don't want them to be tohu vavohu. I want things to have order and structure and life, and I want you to have purpose within it. And so even from these very early narratives of creations, we can draw some pretty incredible conclusions when it comes to us and our understanding of work. So first of all, the world isn't finished yet. It's not actually finished. God instilled it with potential. It's not finished. This is why it's very dangerous to call that first garden perfect, right? Because perfect indicates that something has reached a level of perfection. There's no changing. There's no movement. That's not what God calls it. He says it's good. 
and it's instilled with potential. He says it's very good, which means if the earth and the world isn't finished yet, then we have a role to play within it. The second thing is God invites us to participate alongside him in the ongoing creation of the world. He's like, hey, I want you to partner with me. You're not just something that's off to the side. I need you to play a central role in stewarding that which is alive and filled with potential. Tend to the garden. Give the animal's name. And of course, in our day, in our time, there are other various ways that God is continually calling us to steward this ongoing creating, creation of the world. But thirdly, we need to be reminded that with that responsibility and with that creation that is full of potential, we either contribute to the order or we contribute to the chaos. Right? This is the risk of work. This is the risk that God took where he invited us to be co-participants. We can either contribute to the chaos, and we see examples of that in people's work, expending their energies in order to contribute to chaos rather than life, to contribute to the tohu vavohu rather than the good creation, or we in our work actually step into that role, that reflection of the divine that says, hey, what does it look like to bring order out of the chaos. And so when we talk about work as worship, which again, worship, I've kind of put a bit of a bubble around what that looks like that maybe needs to break. Work, maybe I've put that in a category that doesn't reflect the heart of God. And suddenly when we mesh these two things together and we actually understand the narrative of creation, what we're talking about when we talk about the work and how we can honour and worship God through it is what does it look like to maximise the good that word that God used, good, good, good. What does it look like to maximise the good your work brings to the world for God's glory? It's always for his glory, right? But we have the potential to maximise the good that our work can bring. So I don't know if this is new for you. I don't know if this is a reminder for you. I don't know if that kind of breaks that little worship bubble. I don't know if it breaks that little work bubble. Whatever it might be, again, tonight is a reminder that we are co-participants in what God is doing. So we should not take our work for granted. For we can bring order or we can add to the chaos. There's this guy, David Kinnaman, you may be familiar with him. He is uh, the co-author of a book called Unchristian. Uh, it's not about not being a Christian, it's just talking about trends within Christianity. Uh, and he's a majority owner of the Barna Group, who does a whole lot of research, particularly over in the US, um, from California. And, uh, and uh, Dave Kinnaman, I went to a conference a few years ago and, and got to hear him speak, and he was talking a whole lot about this concept of vocational discipleship. Meigs and I had been talking about this for a long time, the idea that whatever it is that we are called to do, that is vocation, vocative, that's where the word comes from, whatever it is that we're called to do, where we're called to expend our efforts, surely God wants to use this as a not only an opportunity for us to express ourselves as Jesus' disciples, but also to reach others, which we'll talk about next week. And, uh, and Dave Kinnaman, uh, who is a Christian, he, he did some research uh, around this idea of what it is and how it is that God has wired each of us, perhaps to express our calling through various vocations. And, and he divided into three general categories. And I don't know whether you resonate with any of these. He talks about the fact that there's this kind of one group of people who are kind of the entrepreneurs of the world. They're the people who want to make a difference, bring about a change, bring about some sort of transformation. And really, they're, they're kind of the, the value that they have is this idea of abundance. The idea that they are positioned so that they can create more. Create more. Which is great because God is in the business of creating more. He instructed creation itself to do so. Maybe you feel like you're a bit of an entrepreneur that there's some sort of potential that exists that you want to see expressed and it isn't expressed yet. He talked about a second group of people who are kind of more the science-minded people. And these were people who like to bring, particularly bring order out of the chaos. This idea of going, there is so much here, there is so much blessing, there is so much movement, and we just need to get some structure around it, right? Because if we let these expressions run wild, then there's going to be trouble. If people aren't accountable for their behaviour, then things are going to get chaotic. And so there's people who are a bit more kind of science-minded, a bit more order-minded, and they say, I want to create sense. I want to create and make sense of the world and help others make sense of the world because there's so much information out there, there's so much creation out there, and we just need to kind of get a handle on it lest it becomes chaotic. 
And then he talked about this third category, which is the creatives. And their big value is beauty. It's just like, hey, there is this creation and I want to see um, this delight that is expressed from people. It's like, look at this. Isn't it incredible? Look at this piece of art. Look at this piece of music. Look at how I have taken creation and shaped it and formed it and turned it into something that is worth admiring. I love the fact that, again, in the creation narratives, the, the way that the fruit is described in the garden is it was beautiful and looked good to eat. It's like God isn't afraid of beauty. And for the calculative mind, perhaps those more science-minded people, they're kind of like, beauty, uh, you know, it's not producing enough. It's not, uh, abund- sorry, the entrepreneurs might say it's not producing enough, and the science-minded people might go, it's not kind of strategic enough. But, but for the creatives, it's like, hey, this needs to be shown and demonstrated. And I've got to think that perhaps as we think about unemployment in heaven, I've got a funny feeling there's going to be a whole lot more creativity and creatives in that space. <laughs> and so you might identify with one of these things. Somebody who just has this kind of gut instinct, which is like, I just want to create more. Or I want to create something beautiful. And that's fine because it reflects the heart and desire of God within reason. I'll talk about that in a second. You might be more of a science-minded person. You're like, I want to make sense of the world. I want to bring structure. I want to bring clarity. I want people to feel assured that they know their place and they know their responsibilities. Or maybe you're a more science-minded person or maybe you're a creative and you just want people to delight in creation. Now, of course, these things are broad categories and no one's kind of you know, dying on the hill of David Kinnaman and that's totally fine. But sometimes it helps us to think about what our role is as a co-creator with God, you know? as someone who's participating in that ongoing creation of the world. Like, what is my role? Why am I wired the way that I am? And why is the person next to me not wired the same way? Could it be that actually we both reflect the heart of God through our work, but we just haven't quite worked that out yet? Now, of course, more sense, delight, Of course, they all carry risk when taken to the extreme. You want more, 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 and that's kind of your inclination. Well, of course, we can end up absolutely annihilating and destroying the resources and creation that we have if we take that to the nth extreme, right? Even beauty can become a form of kind of consumption orientation, right? Which is just like, I just need more beauty. I just need more, more, more. Like, of course, that's not what we're talking about. Any of these things carry inherent risk. But it would be wrong of us to dismiss our calling and our responsibility. For our work itself is not a secular thing. It's a sacred thing. And it always has been a sacred thing. There is no divide between the spiritual and the secular in that way. Charles Spurgeon said in 1874, one of his sermons, he says, to a man who lives unto God, nothing is secular. Everything is sacred. He puts on his workday garment and it is a vestment to him. He sits down to his meal and it is a sacrament. He goes forth to his labor and therein exercises the office of the priesthood. His breath is incense and his life a sacrifice. To draw a hard and fast line and say, this is sacred and this is secular, is to my mind diametrically opposed to the teaching of Christ and the spirit of the gospel. I love this because each day we wake up and we consider, hey, what is the work that we are called to do? Again, maybe it's professional, maybe it's in the home, whatever that may be. What is the meaningful work that God is calling me to do? And how has God wired me? How has God wired me? Am I here to create more or to create sense or to create delight? And so in combination with this calling that is from God from the very beginning for me, I am going to enter this day recognizing that I am entering sacred space. Just as Moses took off his sandals, he recognized that the ground was holy and he said, God is here. What would it look like for each of us as we stepped into our work to say, God is here already? The calling upon my life has already been given. So therefore, what is today going to look like through my work? In Colossians 3.17, we're reminded of this In whatever you do, whether it be in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through him. In whatever you do, that's everything. 
not just the church stuff, but everything. The way we engage with others over dinner. And yes, for the sake of tonight, the, what we do when we step our feet into that work environment. And so my question to you tonight, and this is the one I really just want us to reflect on as we kind of wrap up, is how does your work, whatever that work looks like, how does that work bring good into the world? And by that good, I'm not talking about some sort of piety good. I'm talking about that good that God refers to right at the beginning of creation. How does your work bring order out of the chaos? How does your work bring more good into the world, more beauty, more abundance in the best sense? You know, for some people it might be obvious, and for others it may be that you need to dig a little bit deeper. I think about teachers that I talk to, and they're working with these chaotic students in their classroom. I don't think it's uh, unjust to call it chaotic at times. And there's something about the role of someone to bring some order out of that chaos that is indeed beautiful. That is indeed being a co-creator with God. It's like I got this raw material and it keeps on reproducing, it's growing, it's evolving, it's not just static, it's actually dynamic, and yet I have a role and a voice to play in helping bring order out of the chaos for this child, for this family, in their understanding of this part of life. For we were not for my words in this context, perhaps the chaos would remain. I think about people who are like accountants and dealing with numbers, Sounds like the most unspiritual thing ever to be working on spreadsheets. And yet, how important are accountants for bringing order out of what can be a very chaotic state? How important are accountants for ensuring there is appropriate accountability for the actions of their employees or for the actions of a company? How, what role does an accountant have in ensuring that justice reigns and that chaos doesn't intrude? We know this to be true. When we sit down at our computer and we look at our spreadsheet and we bring up Excel and it wants an update and we say, do I have to wait for this? But we do because right there in that moment, God has called us to a purpose, to bring some form of good because he wants us to be a part of this co-creation. And like I said, for some of you, this may be a little bit of a harder search than others, but do the search and ask the question, because God has called you to do that work. Sometimes we feel like we're maybe at the bottom of a food chain in regard to some sort of big company. What difference do I make? What kind of order am I bringing out of this chaos? But maybe it is that your small part, in fact it is important that your small part can be a much bigger part when instilled by the power of God. And so I leave you with this question. How would it change our workplaces if we actually deep down believed that God had specifically called you to your workplace at this time for a purpose? What if you saw the work that you do not just as something that's maybe good, but something that is inherently spiritual? something that God has invited you to step into in a profound way. It may just be that there is more creating to be done than we realise. Let's pray. Now, God, you remind us on a regular basis of the beauty of creation. We sit here in Alice Springs. We look around. We see creation and we stand in awe, in many cases, of just the profound beauty of these places. But God, it's kind of also easy to distance ourselves from creation, maybe because we see the chaos, we see the wild and waste. We see that things aren't the way they're supposed to be. But God, will we be reminded tonight that whatever we're stepping into, Management, medical, parenting, teaching. Whatever it is that you have positioned us for, volunteer, 
professional. God, I want to pray that you would open our eyes each and every day to be the kind of people who are ready to bring order out of the chaos. And so, God, whether it's a simple encounter with somebody in the shop in which we serve, or whether it is that we are on the edge of supporting a person in their time of dire need, God, may we know that you are there and that you are at work and that you called us for such a time as this. In your name, amen.